the Space Policy Show. I'm your host, Jordan Bingham. Today, we are talking with author Jennifer Manor, a national spectrums expert and author of Spectrum Wars, The Rise of 5G and Beyond, her second book on the increased competition over spectrum use. Jennifer is also Senior Vice President at Echostar Corporation, Hughes Network System. She will be talking with two senior policy analysts from the Center for Space Policy and Strategy, Audrey Allison, our resident spectrum expert, and Karen Jones, also a space economist. Over to you, Audrey. Thank you, Jordan. Well, we've all been hearing a lot about fifth generation wireless or 5G. Almost every day, it seems, we read something about it in the press. We see tons of, of advertisements uh, from various 5G operators, and we're starting to even see it appear on our, our smartphones themselves. But what does 5G mean to the broader space policy community? Uh, what is the promise of 5G all about? Well, to give us some perspective today, we are very pleased to welcome to the Space Policy Show, Jennifer Manor, who just wrote uh, the book, Spectrum Wars, The Rise of 5G and Beyond. And Karen and I are so looking forward to hearing about your book, Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. So to start off, why don't you tell us about how uh, you came about with this book? What was your, your mission and what you hope your audience takes from it? So, and once again, Audrey and Karen, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so I was watching very carefully and I'm very actively involved in, in the satellite industry and in telecommunications policy generally and watching the debates about 5G. And one of my big concerns was the lack of technology inclusiveness or what I would call technology neutrality in the discussions. And I think 5G is exciting beyond belief, but not just because it's our next generation of mobile technology, mobile wireless terrestrial, but because it encompasses non-terrestrial technologies, both in the sky and in, the, and in space. So I, I really, when I was thinking about things from a policy perspective, um, and I'd written a book called Spectrum Wars in um, the early 2000s, which really was at the cusp of 3G, I, I said, what changed? And you know, 3G was super exciting and 4G, but they were just progressions of mobile terrestrial wireless. And 5G for the first time is encompassing so much more. And for the first time encompassing space, an area that I am very passionate about. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, that's something shared widely among this audience for sure. So tell us a little bit more about the title, Spectrum Wars. What is that all about? Uh, so Audrey, you probably remember from our past history together, one of the big issues that we see is anytime Spectrum is involved, you have many different interests, all literally fighting for access to the Spectrum resource. And that happens both domestically in, for instance, in the United States and FCC proceedings. It also happens internationally at the International Telecommunications Unions at conferences we call World Radio Communications Conferences, which happen about every four years. And that's between governments. So you literally have huge amounts of resources, whether it's government, private sector, all working, all fighting to either A, protect incumbents, or B, get access to new spectrum, or increase sharing a spectrum, which is something I think that's also unique about 5G, and I hope we'll be able to talk about a little, Audrey, which is this concept. We've always had some form of sharing between services, and satellite in particular has been a very good share of spectrum, but you're starting to see this more and more as the spectrum resource gets more and more scarce. And, and you're really also seeing an encroachment into what I call the upper frequency bands that perhaps weren't as attractive a few years ago, but technology has allowed to open up. Okay, we'd like to start with our first question, which is 5G, why is it a national priority in the United States? And to what extent is 5G prioritized over other societal benefits? And then finally, what if we win? And what if we come in second or third? Is that even a problem? 
So I'd like to start with Jennifer, and I think we all have comments we'd like to make about the perceived race for 5G. So Karen, thank you so much for the question. It's it's quite a big question, um, but but let me start with why it's a national priority. And I really do believe it's economic. The United States has always endeavored to be first in terrestrial mobile wireless technology, and it makes sense. Every single person who's probably watching this podcast today has at least one terrestrial mobile device that they rely on, if not more. And with 5G, where we're seeing so many increased use cases, you know, for things like IoT, machine to machine, you know, just so much that I can think of, it's even more important and more important economically. Um, what I what I think is missing from the discussion, and I know this really wasn't your question, but but if you don't, if you'll allow me, um, I think the idea that it's no longer just terrestrial mobile, and that there has to be a broader thing, and I think that's part of when we're striving as a nation for 5G to be first, we've really said 5G has to be first for terrestrial mobile and forgotten the rest of the ecosystem. And I, I think that's a problem for us and maybe something we can delve in a little bit more. Um, in terms of whether we'll really be first in 5G, um, I think that's still a question to be had. We're certainly a leader. Um, and, and what are the major ramifications? You know, I, I think that's a question as well. And I'd love to hear from you and Audrey on that. You know, I think, I think it's, well, it's a tricky question in many ways, but it seems like in some ways the race for 5G is really about how do we set up these networks in a way that creates the right economic platform to enable autonomous cars, IoT, and other new economic opportunities. Um, I still wonder if we really need to be first. Uh, for instance, at some point we were first um, as a nation with LTE, but we have um, a rather slow LTE network and uh, it's also very pricey. So sometimes coming in as a, a quick follower as opposed to coming in first uh, can actually be strategic. Uh, I think what's more important is enabling all those economic opportunities that will follow the 5G platform. Audrey? Another aspect to, to look at is, uh, and this gets back to the Spectrum Wars aspect, is the competition for resources. Uh, 5G has gone way beyond what we saw with 3G and 4G and seeking access to multiple bands of spectrum, spectrum that previously or, or concurrently supports other uses uh, such as weather forecasting or satellite service, other commercial satellite services. Recently in the press, there's been debate about impacts on aviation safety. And we've heard about GPS. So the, there, there are multiple um, public interest uh, issues that um, come to the fore when regulators consider uh, being first in, in 5G in the nation. Uh, one of the fascinating things in your book I've, I found, Jennifer, was how it gets into how 5G requires access to different bands of spectrum, not just the necessary more bandwidth itself, but different kinds of frequency bands. Perhaps that would you could illuminate us a little bit about how 5G is different in, in its quest for spectrum. So, and thanks, Audrey, I'd be pleased to. So unlike um, traditional terrestrial mobile wireless here, and, and I'm still talking about the broader ecosystem, but I, I want to focus first on terrestrial mobile, you're going to have different use cases. So for, um, I want to say for intelligent highways, for instance, um, all of a sudden, you need to have a certain amount of bandwidth at a different frequency range that might be able to support it. You're going to have, you're going to have um, transmitters on every pole or long fences, so you may want to use a, a different bandwidth. Each, each um, category of spectrum, what I would categorize broadly as low, medium, and high, have different technical characteristics. For instance, the high frequency bands, which are typically used for satellite broadband. Um, have have more difficult or more challenging propagation characteristics for terrestrial mobile, so they may be more appropriate for 
a fixed use um, that will support 5G on the ground, but certainly a very good use for satellite broadband. The lower frequency bands have very good propagation characteristics, so you're more likely to use that for um, for more of your your day to day smartphone applications. And then you've also got mid band spectrum, which is critical. So because all of a sudden you're not just looking at the lower frequency bands, what we call the bands below three gigahertz, which have traditionally been the bands that terrestrial mobile has looked at, you're now seeing terrestrial mobile look to all these other bands where there's important services. And then you've also got complementary portions of 5G that are being provided, such as by satellite operators in these higher bands. So you're putting at risk not only other 5G services, but of course, as Audrey mentioned before, other important services, whether they be for aviation, weather, or, or even other fixed uses on the ground. So we're getting the flavor of what the Spectrum Wars is all about. Well, let's, let's dig in a little deeper about this ecosystem or ecosystem of 5G and how it possibly doesn't just compete with, with satellites for Spectrum resources, but how do satellites potentially contribute to 5G? Uh, this is such, I think this is a really exciting place because if we were here, Audrey, you know, five, 10 years ago, we would be talking about 4G and 3G and we wouldn't be talking about other technologies such as satellites. They would be considered. But but let me start first. I think one of the things I've seen, um, so one good thing that came out during the pandemic um, was for the first time I watched an evolution in the standards bodies, 3GPP in particular. Um, and 3GPP, for those of you who don't know, is the standards body that's not in charge because there is no such word as in charge, but is largely responsible for developing standards for, for originally for 3G and then 4G and now 5G, and I expect 6G as well. Um, so really the standards that we build our networks to. Um, about two, three years ago, the satellite industry said, hey, we, we can play a part in, in 5G, and I'll talk about the use cases in a little bit, and went to 3GPP and was hostily met um, no one wanted them included, and I was very proud of the industry, came together, worked to develop support, and just um, actually next month, we're expecting release 17 to come out of 3GPP, which for the first time will include non-terrestrial technologies. There's still a lot more work to be done, but that's an important first step. We're also seeing at the International Telecommunications Union, their term for 5G is IMT, 2020. And in one of the study group meetings there, we're starting to see the development of satellite being considered, and I'm hoping included in the IMT 2020 standard, which is viewed as a very important standard around the world for 5G. Um, but why satellite matters, that's a different story. And just a couple of use cases. First and foremost, um, I think this one's probably an easy for people is Almost everyone knows there are certain places around the world that you're just never going to get terrestrial mobile service. And it could be because of geographic reasons. It could be because of cost. It could be for any of number of reasons. And they tend to be in rural and hard to reach areas. That's a really good sweet spot for satellite. And so we can bring cost effective broadband services to directly to users in those remote areas. But there's other important areas too. And, I, and I'd like to point out um, backhaul for the terrestrial wireless carriers who are offering 5G. Oftentimes their base stations are in extremely rural areas or less densely populated areas. And it, it's expensive to put up base stations and you could use satellite systems to bring service to, their, uh, to the backhaul to the base stations and, and carry the traffic back to interconnect to the public what I still unfortunately call the public switch network, better known as the public internet today, just showing my age. Uh, another great use case is IoT. When you think about the internet of things, you're connecting things everywhere. And, and let's just think about a utility or a railroad for right now. They go through both urban, um, their facilities go through both urban and rural areas. And isn't it great if you can have a hybrid network or an integrated network that's made up of both satellite and terrestrial pieces, and you can combine the two, and all of a sudden you're able to really 
give that sort of service to folks. Same with roadways and intelligent highways. Large portions of, of roads are in un uncovered areas by terrestrial wireless today. And once again, by integrating them into satellite, it's exciting. And, and I, I do want to say we're also at an incredibly important time in the satellite industry. You know, we've had um, very, very, very capable geostationary orbit satellite systems offering broadband service and narrowband service. And now you're having this whole next generation of, of uh, non-geostationary orbit satellites. And they're able to also bring those same services at a lower latency because they're closer to the Earth. So for time sensitive things like um, high, dealing with smart cars and so forth, the Leos are a really good solution. So I, I think, so to speak, it takes a village, Audrey, I think is the term I would use. Well, you anticipated yeah, uh, a question. One thing I would add. Oh. Go um, ahead, Karen. One thing I'd add um, with satellites is the um, efficiency they bring to a network, uh, uh, as particularly for broadcast capabilities, that one-to-many. Mm -hmm. That's how satellites emerge, this kind of one-to-many broadcast capability to reach these billions of IoT devices that may need an immediate update. Just think about autonomous cars and autonomous uh, mobile devices that need a quick update. It's a perfect way to do it. And then of course, multicast streaming. That's a, another great satellite communication uh, strength and one that could be included uh, working closely with the terrestrial um, mobile carriers. And we're starting to see partnerships emerge. And uh, I think that will lessen the rivalry and create you know, a more cohesive ecosystem with time. Yeah, so J Jennifer, are you also starting to see the, the new LEO providers participating in the standard setting activities? Uh, you did anticipate my question about how they will factor into this new ecosystem. Um, you are, I think it's a little slower than I personally would like. And, and I think that's because these systems are, you know, in some cases, even the big folks are, you know, they have big jobs ahead of them putting up um, you know, large numbers of, of new technology satellites is, is certainly resource intensive. Um, so you've got that. Um, and then the smaller folks just, you know, are, are thinly staffed. So, uh, you know, right now, when you look at the participants in 3GPP or at the ITU, it's, it tends to be more of the traditional folks, you know, with a couple of exceptions. But I'm hoping as they start to come to market and start to realize the importance of these bodies that more and more will participate. Um, but I should say, Audrey, one other thing before I forget is, you know, I do think a number of the vendors who support them are participating, and it may not necessarily be the operators. Traditionally, the, the standards bodies have been very good forums for vendors. So you are seeing folks like, um, I'll give you an example, Talus or Airbus, who are extremely active. So even if the operators aren't active, you are seeing some of the underlying vendors, and, and they have a lot of great foresight, so they bring a lot to the discussion. Thank you. Jennifer, I noticed in your book, you mentioned uh, two players, uh, both Link as well as AST, also known as Space Mobile. And they're both working towards, uh, you know, this direct unmodified cell phone to satellite connectivity. And I think that will, to answer Audrey's question, further improve, um, you know, the, uh, um, the complementary nature of uh, satellites and uh, terrestrial uh, wireless. So we're seeing some very interesting partnerships emerge. Link has signed some deals with commercial wireless carriers, and so has AST or Space Mobile. Uh, so that's going to be very interesting. Uh, with time, will we even see any kind of differentiation? All you know, the customers know is the service at the end of the phone. So Karen, I agree with you, but the one thing I can't figure out is how it works. Um, and, and from a spectrum perspective, what, what I'm really interested in, it, and, and it may be different in different countries, but in the United States, terrestrial wireless spectrum. So these systems are, are really interesting and they wanna reuse the spectrum that's used by the mobile operator in partnership with them on their satellite system. So we have a couple of spectrum issues there that I, I would like to walk through. First, that spectrum that's not allocated to satellite services at the ITU. So, so that raises a whole bunch of questions in terms of interference. Can it really be used on the satellite system? 
can they really operate on a non-interference basis and what has to be done there? And, and unfortunately, that hasn't been raised at the ITU. So even if they want to bring that to the ITU, it's going to take um, several years till it gets on an agenda. But I say the second issue is where you've got a variety of different license sizes. So in many places in the world, terrestrial wireless spectrum is licensed on a country basis, countrywide basis, but that's not the case in the United States and a number of other countries. And let's say you're working with operator X and um, AST or Lynx wants to use the spectrum of operator X on their satellite, but an adjacent geography operator Y doesn't. And, and how do you deal with the interference between the two service areas, especially for use of a service that the spectrum's not allocated and it may not have the appropriate technical rules. So I, I do think it's really exciting and it was a vision, um, I think the United States had early on with their mobile satellite service with the terrestrial component, which hasn't gone quite as far as they'd like either, but I'm not so sure that from an interference perspective, you can quite get there yet, um, but it's still to be remained. They're not licensed in the US yet, they have pending applications. And I, I do know they have some exciting partnerships globally. So certainly I, I, I'll be watching with great interest. Right, they're, they're in demo phase uh, at this point, trying to demonstrate the capabilities and how well they'll perform. So moving on, um, one of the questions we wanna um, ask you about is efficient use of spectrum. Um, Jennifer, in Spectrum Wars, you encourage increasing use of spectrum resource and calling for uh, more stringent build-out requirements, including uh, monitoring potential use, and as a last resort, explore increased spectrum sharing. How big a problem is underutilized spectrum, and how can we encourage greater use of spectrum resources? So like any scarce resource, you're going to want to get the most use out of that resource as possible. But at the same point, you need to provide sufficient flexibility for folks to have long-term certainty. You may not be able to build out the spectrum overnight and put it into use. You have to have users. And you also potentially want to make sure you have future ca capacity. Um, so it's a very hard problem. Um, one of the things I think that was done fairly early on was the concept that you have to bring your spectrum into use. You have to actually use it. And that's really the question, Karen, is what is use? What does use look like? Um, there's a number of studies, and, and I'm not an engineer by training, so I won't be able to comment on how valid they are, that certain bodies of users, whether they're terrestrial or otherwise, may not be using their spectrum as fully as possible. And that's really why you've seen some of the actions taken by regulators who are trying to increase the use. And, and you know, you saw incentive auctions um, even before really early on by the FCC um, during the Obama administration, I just don't remember during when, with the concept that the broadcasters may not be using their spectrum as efficiently. So what if we give them an incentive, a financial incentive to, to use their spectrum more efficiently, maybe to pack it a little bit more efficiently. And we saw that was actually quite successful. Um, similarly, um, another good example was the FCC with the C-band. That's a satellite example. You had a number of C-band satellite operators. And what the FCC said was, you know, if, if you can clear this certain portions, we're gonna give you a certain amount of money. And, you know, and so you can build new satellites that will make use of the spectrum more efficiently, a little less spectrum. And so once again, we saw that as very successful. Um, I have to say, I was actually personally surprised. Um, and you've even been able to see that the, some of the operators have been able to move faster, getting even greater payments. So I, I think there is some question to how efficiently people are using the spectrum. And I think it's incumbent on operators and regulators to work together to see if there's ways to do it. Now there's times where this isn't appropriate. And I'll give you a good example, one area um, then I've spent a lot of time on um, professionally and personally was with regard to satellite use in the KA band. That's that's a frequency band that's been the workhorse for the satellite broadband industry. And if you look at all the new systems that are coming on board and the existing systems, whether it's um, Hughes and Viasat today, or you're looking at OneWeb, Starlink, Amazon, I, I could go on, Telesat, I can go on and on. They're all using that spectrum because it's such important spectrum for satellite. 
and it's been allocated across the globe for use. And you're starting to see terrestrial operators more and more um, focus on that band. And that's a band where sharing becomes more difficult because it's used for widely deployed services by the satellite industry to user terminals. And one thing we've learned is we still haven't figured out a way, at least that I've heard of, where you can have two widely deployed services, things like individual cellular phones, smartphones, and user terminals for satellite in the same band and have them share. There's just certain things that are very, very difficult. So I do think you have to look at bands specifically and, and the same case with some of the government uses. Um, I always get concerned in some of the quiet uses as how do you share? Um, you know, that's always been a problem and, and something that I know everyone's always looking at. We, we can see that the spectrum policy and regulatory world is uh, a very fertile ground uh, for uh, people who want to challenge. And the, the book is fascinating in that it explores these topics from a spectrum manager viewpoint in many cases. Uh, so I enjoyed that very much. So we've been talking a little bit about third and fourth generation and mostly about 5G, the fifth generation. But uh, you hear talk already underway about what comes after five, which is typically six. So sixth <laughs> generation. Jennifer, what are you hearing about 6G? Where are we going to fit that in? So thanks for the question, Audrey. This was one um, that I I actually did a fair amount of reading because I didn't really know either when I started this. And so this was a real educational process for me. Um, part of it was kind of terrifying um, because uh, when you think about it, it's also known as the internet of the senses. And, and the concept is, and, and you know, whether this is 6G or 7G by the time we get there, um, the concept is that you're going to start to not just pay attention to what's going on around you, but but also how people interact. And you know, I think you know there's some some of the um, billionaires, for instance, are starting to look at things like uh, you know neural networks and even um, implanting chips inside people's heads, not to scare people, to be able to to be able to control electronics. And I, I would like to say it's not that new. For those of you who maybe remember, there was a, a movie called The President's Analyst in the 1960s, and I believe it was with James Brolin, where there was a chip, the phone company, TPC, implanted a chip inside people's heads. So, so this isn't, it's science fiction in the 60s, but it could be coming true soon. But, but I think what you're really going to see is a lot more sensing. And, and I actually think that's incredibly important because space is going to be increasingly more important. If you're going to be sensing things, you need to have a place to cover everything. And at the end of the day, the only networks that I can truly see as covering everything are satellite. And so I do get worried when, when governments start saying, well, we're going to sacrifice satellite spectrum, um, you know, whether it's government or private sector, so that it can be used for terrestrial 5G, because I think the next generation system is going to be so much more satellite dependent. And and the majority of the literature that I was reading and a lot of the work that's going on in the labs by the experts is focused on that. So I, I think you're going to move from where you see non-terrestrial as a complementary aspect of 5G to a world where it is perhaps the driver of 6G or certainly playing a lot larger role. And and you mentioned before there there's um, increasing possibility of conquering higher spectral regions yes. to support these services. We've already seen satellite services starting to use the QV band, um, but we're hearing about terahertz band for some of these new 6G applications as well. So I that, guess that's stay tuned. <laughs> So Jen, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned also the World Radio Conference that comes up mm -hmm. about every four years, the Global Spectrum Conference uh, uh, that's convened by the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. So uh, we and we have one coming up at the end of next year, 2023. Uh, so how do you see the, the future spectrum wars playing out at, at the next World Radio Conference, if you have anything to say about that? 
So thanks for the question, Audrey. I, I do. Um, I, I, you know, very active in this space. Um, and, and I think one of the areas we're going to see is um, there's a continued search by the terrestrial mobile industry for more IMT 2020 spectrum or 5G spectrum. And there's a number of bands identified. And, and some of those have some very, um, very important incumbents. Um, so we're seeing, and those are not just against space, but also um, terrestrial incumbents. For instance, one of the big issues we're going to see is whether the six gigahertz band is going to be used for licensed or unlicensed terrestrial wireless. Um, and just so happens that in the six gigahertz band, a number of satellite operators are there too. So that's a good band to just point out that you've got competing uses. Um, one of the unknown issues um, that I think probably keeps a number of us um, guessing what's going to happen is there was an agenda item uh, agreed to at the last conference to start to look at all of the fixed service bands. Those are bands where you've got point to point and point to multi-point fixed uses of the spectrum and whether they should be identified for IMT really for fixed use as well. And when we talk about identification, it serves as a flag to countries on where they should place, in this case, 5G. Um, that covers every band that the fixed services use. And of course, a number of those bands are shared by a number of different radio services, important uses. So that's a real unknown action, what's going to happen there. And, and then we're seeing a number of other important issues being addressed here. For instance, um, there's a number of operators who'd like to have dedicated IoT spectrum for satellite and, and, and they're looking at bands that are used for important government uses, including in the United States Department of Defense and NATO bands in, the, in Europe. Um, but they're also um, proposing changes to the allocation table. So I can think of a, a number of areas um, and, and maybe I can bring up one, uh, Audrey, before I sign off, because I do think this one's very interesting, is this concept of inter-satellite links. Um, with more and more NGSO systems, um, there needs to be a cost-effective way to bring traffic back to ground. And so these systems are looking, um, both commercial and non-commercial systems are using geos so that they would require less earth stations they could gather traffic on in space and then beam it down to earth with less earth stations, which would reduce costs of the networks. So there's an important agenda item on that, looking at a band that's already very heavily used, the KA band for satellite, and how those can operate together, because you certainly don't want to jeopardize the important broadband satellite systems that are going using those bands right now. But you also want to be able to bring additional services at cost-effective rates. So that's one where there has to be a balance. So we have spectrum no, competition, you. even among the satellite operators themselves. Yeah, speaking of balance, one of the things that I'm interested in is spectrum optimization for the public good. How do you measure that? It's very difficult, but I don't think we're seeing enough detailed cost benefit analysis and I think we would all be better off if regulators could really focus on what is the value of the spectrum across various uses and, and really do some detailed economic studies uh, because it seems like spectrum is getting scarcer. There's more users, uh, compounded annual growth rate for mobile data is through the roof. I think it's over 40% growth. So how can we do this in a way that's really mindful of the public good and optimizing that resource. Um, so that's one thing I'd like to see uh, come out of uh, some of these studies is detailed economic studies with cost benefit analysis. So Karen, I support you 100%. And um, when I was last in the government, um, I was at the Federal Communications Commission and had the opportunity to work on the National Broadband Plan. And that was a great honor because our driving force, um, led by Chairman Janikowski and 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 um, folks there, was to always make it fact based. And I, I think that was a really high point, um, at least in my personal professional or my professional life, was the idea that you should have fact based data. 
the problem, and I think if you look at most regulators around the world, there's some sort of public interest obligation, just like the U.S. has. Um, the problem is politics and money gets in the way. So, um, but what I would urge, and I fully support is the right thing to do, is that regulators should look to objective data and objective methodologies. I think when you start becoming too subjective, it, it's problematic and it really is hard. It's hard being a regulator. It's hard. It's not always in everyone's interest to provide the data because the data doesn't always support what they're advocating. So it is a very hard thing. And I don't have a magic I wish I had a magic wand I could wave and figure out how to do it. But I agree with you. I think until we have objective measures and we really put out the facts, you're never really going to have the best, best way forward on sharing of spectrum and making the most efficient use of this important resource. Right. And making the transparent, uh, making the process transparent as well. Very important. Yeah, maybe I could talk one one thing I was excited to see. Um, actually, Audrey and I had the opportunity to serve on the last Commerce Spectrum Management Advisory Committee. And I think one thing we were very proud of was we actually were able to successfully release recommendations to the U.S. government on how to increase sharing between NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration at the Department of Commerce and the Federal Communications Commission especially in sharing between government and non-government spectrum and coordination. Um, we put those recommendations out and we weren't sure they were gonna go anywhere. And just the past week or two, we've seen announcements by the chairwoman of the FCC. Um, we've seen some very good um, announcements by the head of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration that they're gonna work to also um, increase sharing, come up with a national spectrum strategy. Some of the things that we, thought were really important. So I am hoping transparency is part of that as well, to the extent possible. Of course, there are certain things that that are classified and we understand that. But I think the more transparency in that process and the more certainty, that will also help us going forward, not just for 5G, but for 6G as well. Right. This dual agency approach for spectrum regulation, it has its reasons, but there are significant coordination challenges involved as well. So hopefully that will help. And we, I think we've heard enough statements over the past few months to realize, I think they, they definitely are going to focus more on that coordination. So it's a good thing. As a last question, uh, I would just wanted to follow up and uh, ask you, what are your uh, thoughts uh, regarding Spectrum Wars, what would you like people to take from this book if you had to list, you know, the top maybe two or three things that you think are the, the key messages of the book? So um, thank you for the question. I think it's a great one. I, I would start with, uh, I, you know, I, I think, and part of why I originally wrote my first book was to educate people on how important this is, but how complex it is. And I think it's really important when we hear complaints about access to spectrum and so forth, that we realize that there is a complex process and that the process is actually really important to go through. You know, I think, Karen, you said it very well before when you said, you know, you want transparency, you want it to be objective and so forth. But, I, you know, but I think if people don't know there is a process and how important it is, you don't realize that there are these competing uses. So I think the fact that we have um, an important process we go through to make spectrum available, um, that spectrum is a critical resource and that it's scarce, but that there are ways in which we can make more efficient use working together and how critical that is as well. And the corollary to that I might add is that when someone comes up with an exciting new service that requires spectrum access and including anybody who's proposing a new new space service they've got to not have spectrum as an afterthought that's got to be very early on in their list of of things to achieve as part of their business plan is obtaining access to spectrum resources and so many times that's an afterthought and can be a problem with new businesses 
Yeah, absolutely. When you think about what we're up against, in the past 100 years, the world population has quadrupled. The thirst for mobile data is through the roof. Uh, this challenge is not going away. It's actually just escalating at this point. So uh, I think it's a very timely uh, book, Spectrum Wars, and uh, we look forward to your follow-on book. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. So thank you so much for having me, both of you, Audrey and Karen. It's been a pleasure. I very much appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And back to you, Jordan. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining us today. Great title of the book, Building on Your Spectrum Wars Brand. Our executive producer is Colleen Stover and our technical director is James Liggins. You can find more of our shows at csds.aerospace.org or check us out on Twitter using hashtag the Space Policy Show. We look forward to having you tune into our next episode.